my name is Chris Harman. Um, I currently work for Barclays Bank, a UK investment bank. A um, little bit about myself, um, I've been a software tester for around about 15 years. Um, so I've been around the block a few times, I've seen a lot of things, I've, I've been shot a few times, I've got the marks to show if you don't believe me. Um, and I've been with Barclays for around um, six years. Um, and I've actually joined Barclays from Singapore um, a couple of years ago and coming to Prague. So, by the way, I'm South African for those who want to kind of see what my accent is already. Okay, so um, unfortunately, um, I kind of broke my own cardinal rules when I actually prepared this um, presentation. So, first of all, I didn't quite check it out. So, I had a last minute laptop swap um, for various reasons and uh, unfortunately you won't be able to enjoy the first two slides which might have been interesting um, but hopefully if these notes are shared um, I am sure that um, these will be kind of bonus features for those who are into that kind of things. Alrighty, so um, let's start. So basically for those who are interested in, in seeing this as a um, master class in software testing, well this is not quite the right class or the right session for this. Um, if you are expecting a complete exposition of how to test a really complicated um, system or being a demo with the latest applications or tools or whatever you might have it in the software testing world, well kind of this is also not the right session. Um, so what I want to look at um, is, is kind of analyze some core um, kind of characteristics um, in the software testing world. So uh, for those who have ever or want to Google a little bit about context-driven testing, uh, well, I want to kind of touch on those principles a little bit um, in the context-driven um, testing world for those who might be interested in having a little bit more information about that. Um, and basically, um, let's focus a little bit on the mindset of a tester and um, also obviously testing, uh, contrary to software development, is about making sure that um, you don't fall into traps because A, you're not the person that you set those traps and uh, people expect you to make sure that you navigate the project or the program or whatever you were testing around all these issues that might pop up out of unaware and without you actually knowing about it. And also the kind of important factor for testing is, so I've done some testing, so how do I communicate that I've actually done some testing, which actually is not as simple as you might think. Alrighty, so um, if I might use um, Sir David Attenborough and let's kind of sketch the scene, right? So let's assume that we are in the wild, we are in, the, in a typical software development company and um, you might see some people running around and um, somebody might tell you, well, hey, he's a tester. So, um, and you might actually ask somebody, so um, how do you actually test? What do you do while you're doing some software testing? And um, some really clever people came up with this kind of analysis and um, it took a few years, apparently, I was told by who created this, that this is kind of behavior to know when you are doing some good testing. So um, let's call it the testing loop syndrome. So what this basically means is the center of it all will be your analysis. So a critical thing about being a software tester is you need to be able to understand um, and you need to be able to kind of take huge pieces of data, well not huge, but sometimes huge, um, break it down into little pieces and um, basically do a whole bunch of stuff with that. So typically how a human mind works, is, and this is probably all start, is you can look at the knowledge and the analysis loop. So what that basically means is um, when I get introduced to new software, and that could be either somebody throws a system in front of me or I get a 15 million page specification document, I obviously have to spend some time a learning or understand what is actually being presented to me. So um, as all humans do, we can learn it by studying it, we can learn it by playing around with it, um, we can ask people questions about it, things like that. Um, so that's kind of an important area and um, note that any gaps or any kind of things you miss during this time will manifest itself in all sorts of cruel, cruel and wonderful ways later in the project or whatever you've been doing. Um, the next bit is the kind of the, um, the let's talk about it loop. So obviously um, before I can understand something I need to communicate to somebody what my understanding of something is, right? So if I tell you or somebody tells me, oh, test this system, it basically loads 15 million records in some co Java coherence cache, 
go and test it. Um, well, you would probably need to understand, first of all, how that actually works and, um, and, and kind of gather yourself so you'd be able to understand what your coverage is. So you need to understand what you need to look at, what you need to do. Um, next bit is, um, yeah, is the crash test dummy phase or the experimental phase. So you kind of have kind of an understanding how things work or how they're supposed to work um, or they're not supposed to work. And uh, you would go in and you would actually perform some tests. And you would actually have a look at it and see, well, how does this actually work? So this is where the experimental phase comes in. So um, obviously, um, systems come in various um, shapes and forms. If you can transact with the system in various ways from a GUI screen, it could be a web service call, or it could be many things actually. And, um, and obviously, that kind of loop helps you to, um, to understand how you actually interact with the system. That helps to understand, okay, so I see this, but what does it mean? Is it right, wrong? What do I do with it? The next bit is actually pulling in other people. So here's a bit of a social kind of component that makes testing quite interesting because, A, you can do testing without even knowing how, know, knowing how the system works. You can be able to do testing, complex testing on technology, you have no idea what it's all about, and you can just kind of steal your information from other people. So you can run around in, 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 and, and, um, and try to gather information or work with other people, coordinating, whatever the case might be, um, and interact with other people in whatever way or form to help you to form a richer kind of idea of what you need to test. So all in all, this is kind of a cyclical kind of session. And as you go through testing something, you might go in various iterations and various loops. Um, obviously, as you know, um, it's not I need to understand everything now, and once I understand the whole world, let me go on and see um, what I need to do and look at the next batch. And um, it doesn't work like that. So as humans are, you might be testing something, and it might be two days before you're done, you find out like, oops, I forgot this big functionality. I need to run back, change it, and see what happens. Or after planning for five years on something, you might find out that some team has been doing exactly the same thing you've been doing. And then you find out that they were actually better than you and you have to kind of give up on what you started. So, yeah. So, I've got a little bit of an exercise. So, I hope I get some answers from people. So, if I, I pick on somebody, um, I hope I get some hands in the air. So, basically, let's, um, let's, let's try to demonstrate a, a theory. So, basically, the scenario behind it is, is that you are given a whole barrel of coffee beans and you are given three containers. So um, somebody was really bored and decided that um, you need to, for whatever scenarios I'm about to give you, come up with a way how you need to, to, to use the only scoops in those three containers I've given you. In other words, it might be a med large, a medium, and a small container. And you can only use those scoops to kind of get the exact amount of um, coffee beans that whatever the scenario might request you to do. Is that right? So uh, let's start off. So basically, um, you have, in the first scenario, you have a big scoop that can contain 1,200 coffee beans. You have a medium one that can contain 700, and you've got a small one that can contain 200 um, coffee beans. So can anybody tell me how you would use those three scoops to get 1,700 coffee beans? Five times the two hundred is one, and one time the seven hundred is one. No, five times the two hundred, and one time the seven hundred. Five. So basically, what you want to do is you can have, so your big one can you can scoop in one thousand two hundred coffee beans with your big scoop, all right. And with a small, a medium one, you can take seven hundred, and then the small one takes two hundred, right? And you need a total of one thousand seven hundred coffee beans. So uh, by taking you said five, which ones? Yeah, I, I think I didn't understand the question. Yes. No, I thought it's a rephrase that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's like this you need to, uh, that, uh, you can use just that three, not like you have a barrel and you. Yeah, you have to use, yeah, sorry, you have to use all three and uh, you have and you don't have to worry because these scoops exa will exactly contain the number of coffee beans as it's stated on the example over here. So, any other volunteers? <coughs> so uh, you have to fill up uh, the one thousand. Uh, yeah, you have to. You have to use your scoops. You have to pick up coffee beans. And then the uh, spell up 
to the two thousand, the fill up, from the, the biggest to the smallest, and then uh, from the middle uh, you will m match uh, the, the 17, the 700 and uh, 1000, and you will get the uh, 1700. So what you're saying is you would take 1,000, the big one, you take one scoop of the big one, you take one of the medium one, and then you take the small one and you take some of it out of the scoop so you can get 1,700, right? Uh, the, the small one uh, will be the rest. Oh, so you wouldn't use the small one. Would anybody use a small scoop? No, basically he's, he told him, right, uh, he thought that just add the big one, remove the smallest one, oh, and then add the writing. Okay, I didn't catch that, sorry about that. So, sorry, what's your name? Paul. Hi, Paul. So, Paul. so, Paul basically gave you guys an understanding of how you tell a testing story, because he had to understand the problem. He had to kind of formulate some experiment, something in his head, and he came up with a story that he communicated. Okay, next example. So, this time around, the numbers are... On the, on the screen. Anybody with um, a strategy on how to get the right number of beans? Do you have any volunteers? This could go for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the same situation as before. Okay, all right. This one? It's the double, double big one. It's still the same. Yeah. The same. The, the same way as the previous one? Not the same. Not the same. Okay. So you say double, double the big one, and then, okay. Sounds good, right? Yep. Next one. Okay, next one. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Would be the next one. By the way, this is the number four was just take 1,000 um, and then use this 550 scoop four times. Um, to add, subtract it, and use this the ten times twice, and you would use the number. So, what would be the fifth one? Uh, if I haven't said it now, maybe you could fill the uh, big one and the middle one, and subtract uh, the small from the middle one, and then you get a six five five. Correct. Mm -hmm. What about this one? So it's similar, similar to, to the first one, <coughs> exactly the same principle. So 
So first of all, I would like to say congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> um, the times I've actually presented this to software testers, um, most people actually got number five not correct because if you look at number one, two, three, and four, and number six, all kind of follow the same pattern, right? Where you basically have the big one, a small, a medium one, and you subtract the, the little one. Um, so the idea is to kind of have this done really, really quick, but I guess it doesn't always work with bigger crowds. But um, basically, what, um, what this actually teaches us is that sometimes we are indoctrinated um, in um, our brain, that's just how our brain works, right? So say for example, if A plus B equals C, um, surely if you change A and B, then surely C, C, C must change as well, it's just how it works. Our brain is, is geared up to see patterns, our brains are geared up to kind of see what we can um, reuse, um, what we can, we can, uh, what we can do differently, and that's just how our brain is kind of wired together. Well, with software testing, it's exactly the opposite because you might never know when the trap comes. So things might look like a pattern, things might look similar, but in fact, they could be different for various reasons, and that is why I said early on that you need to be mindful of traps and what they, where they are set and how they can occur. Alrighty, so um, how do you now go about um, and um, finding those traps? So um, an obvious one is, is to um, say, well, let's ask questions. So, so what does it mean by asking questions, first of all? Um, questions are kind of a, a skill that, um, that, that might be culturally not acceptable. It might be in the environment that you're working where everybody kind of knows what each other is doing and obviously you might have less questions um, to ask uh, and, and things like that. So, um, so let me just ask somebody a question. Do I have a volunteer? Anybody, can I ask somebody a question? Any volunteers? So if I ask you guys what the question is, will I get a volunteer? Let, let's try. So the question here is, since I got a new um, a MacBook this weekend, um, let's make it kind of contextual. So um, say for example, um, I give you the, the, uh, the, the MacBook and I ask you, what would you do to make sure that this thing actually works? All right, what would you answer? Do I have any volunteers? I would turn it off, turn it on. All right, cool. So your name is? Sorry? Your name is? Erika. Sorry? Jerry. Jerry, okay. So congratulations, Jerry. You just fell into the first trap. <laughs> so why would that be, right? So, um, so basically, when somebody tells you something, you cannot assume that your understanding is similar than his, right? So I told um, Jerry that um, I, I gave him the laptop and he needs to make sure that it works. Well, first of all, did you actually ask me that I kind of physically give it to you? Do you actually have it in your hand, right? It's like you've made some assumptions and you made maybe some suggestions of what could it possibly be, right? Um, it's good to be think, think about various things, right? Say, for example, I had this one argument we're saying that um, you could be in a car and you could have been hit. You could be in a traffic accident while somebody's actually give, giving you the laptop and the laptop could fly out of the window and then you could break it a thousand pieces and then if you want to go ahead and say, well, okay, let me see if I switch it on. It's okay. well, maybe that's not such a good thing to do. Um, yeah, um, another interesting question that you would ask is, um, or some, something I've heard is that Say for example, you might have been next to a nuclear reactor and uh, it might have just fell into some bottomless pit and you'd actually not be able to ever get the laptop again. So again, if you are tell somebody, oh, I'm going to switch it on and see if it works, that's also not going to work because you're actually not being able to retrieve it. All right. So um, basically, does anybody have some additional kind of questions they would like to ask me when I ask you exactly that same question again? Why are you going to use it? That's a good question. So yes, um, I'm going to use it to play a a new a new YouTube video. So how would that change your your test? So there are some steps which I need to play a YouTube video. 
So I will try to find those steps which are needed for the, for your action. For example, so how would you test it? How if I tell you I want to take I want to view this YouTube video and I've given you the laptop, you get it in your hand, got your gravity paws on it, you're going to, to, to see if this video works. What would you how would you test this? Uh, I would like to ask you which video do you want to play? Alright, um, well, you, you, you decide. <laughs> okay, so I will try to play a few videos and I will decide whether it works or not. Alright, so, so does anybody have an idea why that answer is not quite correct? We don't know what browser. Well, Maybe that's one, use. that's one, that's a good one, yeah. Which, anybody, anybody else? Well, do you have internet connection? Correct, yeah, that's another one, right? Anybody else got some other suggestions? Okay, well, I guess I guess it's probably just kind of a, a question, um, and I'll probably delve a little bit that deeper into that. All right. So, um, what I would like to introduce you guys is the her really so heuristic. So, for those who don't know what heuristic means, so let's start off with things that you might not know. So, a heuristic is a very clever way that somebody came up with and saying, well, I've got a problem to solve, either a testing problem, a development problem, a life problem, my cat has run away, how do I go about and solve my problem? So, obviously, it might not be um, correct, but at least it's a good way to start, all right? Um, looking back at the hook, really so, so after I told you guys what this is about, Probably I wouldn't use this on your girlfriends or boyfriends, whatever the case might be. It probably is not such a good idea. So basically, what does her really so mean? So, simple, right? So when somebody tells you something, whether it be related to software, whether it be related to a problem that you need to solve, the obvious question would be, huh? So what does her mean? Her means, well, I kind of don't have all the information I need. I kind of need a little bit more information, so please tell me more. And this is where you obviously need to ask questions, as I said before. Is your, is your laptop in the Sahara? Um, are you in some African country where you need to plug into a modem? Um, is there some other security? Are you in China where you're not able to access YouTube or whatever the case, or North Korea, or whatever the case might be? Um, something like that you need to take into consideration. Um, the really is, well, thank you for that information, but a, it doesn't really make that much sense. Um, or B, I kind of need a little bit more information for me to understand what I need to do. So obviously, when I just go back to previous slides, where I said, well, okay, let's look at um, how I can gather some knowledge. So obviously, everybody, every single one of us has got some knowledge that they have about something, whether it be some opinion you have, or whether it be about somebody else's opinion, whatever the case might be. You need to have something that you can make yourself um, and make it make yourself the owner so that you can enhance your knowledge to actually go and solve the problem and of course the so would basically be okay that is really good so you tell me all these things you kind of give me all the information i could come up with and all the questions that i gave you you could kind of answer so what does it mean so what do you want to do with it so um what kind of a risk must i look at is there anything that i've missed things like that all right, so, um, so what this basically means is that um, if we can basically just use that example I used previously. So, as I said before, um, we're going to play some YouTube videos um, and um, obviously you need to do it on a, on a new MacBook. Um, and um, let's look at it. So basically, the her part, well, we kind of answered it okay. All right, so we kind of know we are, we are here in Prague. Uh, we kind of know we want to play some random videos, it doesn't really matter. Um, um, the, the really might be, well, what do you want to do with videos? Well, I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> kind of scenario, it, it really depends on what the scenario is all about and what you want to get out of it. Um, the so would be, okay, so now after I've demonstrated to you that you've gone ahead and um, I showed you the YouTube videos and you're happy with what you see, what are you going to do with about it? So I was just going to say, okay, that is really cool because I didn't know how YouTube worked. That would be something simple, simple, whatever the case might be. Alright? Um, another thing that you should be guarded out, and that's why 
I think the first problem, the first answer to my question was, okay, I will switch it on and see if it works. Sometimes one makes a lot of assumptions, um, and um, sometimes the assumption I make and the assumption I want you to make is not the assumption that you have in your mind. I mean, it's all about clashing and about exchanging ideas. So, thinking about how we're going to basically um, actually ask questions, well, <coughs> it's always good to say, well, why would I want to ask questions? Well, obviously, I want to get some answers. So, a good and easy way to remember it is just called the try it and see if it works. All right, that may sound like a pretty simple thing to, to consider. It might sound like it's not, but it's quite it's quite um, quite cool in what it actually tells you. So obviously, being tested, the first thing you would do is kind of trying to see and analyze it. So in this specific case, I grab some words out of it and kind of associate it to some ideas that I have. So obviously, um, the first bit kind of would tell you how I would approach a problem. So how would you know how to switch on a computer, how do you know to use the internet, how would you know how to, to make sure, know that your YouTube video is playing like it should be, how do you know which YouTube, how to select a video on YouTube, whatever the case might be. So um, the second bit is to see, right? So obviously we use our eyes, we use what we call modeling, which is a tool um, which our, our mind basically works to help us to classify information that we, that we use. So there's a whole bunch of cognitive recognition, if you guys are interested in that. But basically that tells how our brains are wired to, to know whether something is right or whether something is wrong. So the only way, and, and I guess that's where it comes in, works. Okay, so the question is, how would you know that it works, right? Is there any specific things that um, that you guys think that I've missed in, in our wonderful YouTube MacBook scenario on, on how it works? So do you think that we have enough information to know how something should work? Well, good question. All right. So the, the obvious answer would be no, right? Otherwise I wouldn't ask you this question. But anyways, no. Uh, what it works uh, basically means that obviously when you do something, when you do software testing, it is really important to understand what the person who requested something of you have, um, the questions that they have, what are the answers that you need to give them, and what and why you should give information and when you should give that information, which kind of hopefully brings us to the next kind of slide. I hope you guys can read there. Mm -hmm. guys managed to kind of understand what that was all about? So basically, any, so here's an opinion, so let's, by show of hands, let's see how I agree. So who thinks this was a good scenario? Any, any hands? Alright, does anybody think this was a completely waste of a scenario? Alright, we've got one hand, two hands. Any, any other people? The third one is, do you think that um, Ted, which is the kind of guy who, who talks a lot, do you think that um, he, he, um, he, he could, you could re, re, reword what he said? All right, okay. So, um, the next question I would ask is, um, do you think that the, well, the guy that's not Ted, <laughs> let's call him John, do you think he is valid in his response? Do you think it was a suitable response that he gave? Any, any, anybody say he gave a suitable response? Anybody think he did not give a suitable response?
Okay, well, the answer is no, he also did not give a suitable response. So what this slide is all about is, um, as a taster, we would be um, um, asked to kind of give people an understanding of what we've done um, at any point in day. So the scenario here would be, as the slide said, at the end of the day, you would have your project manager coming up to you and say, so what is happening? And um, what is important, um, and, and sometimes that's what people tend to do, people try to give too much information um, and basically could confuse somebody. So the risk of that being that um, you could give too little information. All right. So another situation that is really important and when you report on something is, do you understand the implications of what would happen? So luckily in this slide, nobody was killed. Um, but can you imagine if somebody at Apple would send a status report one day before the new iPhone goes out and he says, oh, we are red because we've got so many issues that we need to resolve, blah, 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 blah. What would be the impact of it? It could have huge commercial impact. It could have court cases and all those kind of things. Factories would come to a standstill. People might lose their jobs. It's very really important to understand. All right. Something that also you need to understand it. So what is the correct information to give to who? So obviously, when somebody comes to you at the end of the day, he just wants to know, okay, everything is okay. I can go home now and I can just go, go to the pub and have a drink. Or I have to stay longer at the office because obviously things still need to, to, to happen here and things still need to, um, need to be fixed before we can have kind of a relaxing end of the day. So, um, yeah, that's basically what it boils down to. And um, the, the problem that, so uh, let's, let's maybe look at what has gone wrong here. So, obviously, we'll have Ted giving way too much information. So, in the software testing world, this is a very common occurrence, believe it or not. Um, and it's good to talk to people that doesn't come from that background. <laughs> um, what the project manager should always understand is that the project manager needs to kind of communicate this clearly as to what they want, because potentially this conversation could have been maybe 20 slides or 20 pictures, whatever the case might be, and actually understanding exactly what you want. Again, the TED decided that, oh, okay, I want to give as much information while using the least amount of words, which is not the right thing to do, because sometimes we think that we need to summarize something so that we can cover as many things as we possibly can. Well, that is actually incorrect. The correct answer would be, do I give you enough information so that you, I, you, can, you can make your mind up for what you want me to have told you about, if that makes any sense. <laughs> All right. Okay, so... Um, so let's make it a little bit more kind of um, kind of more bulky specific. Could, so you, could you maybe adjust the cable? We can't oh. see. Sorry. Is it a bit light? Not sure. Sorry, I'm blind, I'm standing right in front of Alrighty. Okay, so basically within Barclays, um, we've got various testing organizations within Barclays. Obviously, we are a company of over 125,000 people. We have roughly about 10 software divisions. Uh, I currently, well, I, I represent the biggest one, so we are, I guess, about 1,500 software testers distributed all across the world, some in Prague, a few of us. Most of us are in India, we have some in Singapore, we have some people in Glasgow, we have some people in New York, and we have some people in London, Kiev, although not anymore, and also in Tel Aviv. So it's the, it's the only organization that actually covers all the divisions of the bank, and it's really cool if you want to jump jobs. Ask me, I've done it. The next one, uh, um, is obviously we have some training. So obviously some of these slides we actually do use in our training that we have that we present to, to all new joiners. Um, we have some, some interesting happenings um, in terms of specialists. So we have automation, which is kind of a big thing in Prague, um, where we actually use automation frameworks 
to um, actually do the software testing that we do. So we typically use, I don't know if you guys have ever heard about um, test driven development or from BDD, whatever the case might be, where we actually use um, tools such as Specflow for .NET applications. We use JBehave, which is a kind of an open source um, framework for Java. And uh, we actually automate testing before we actually perform it manually. So we kind of done away with saying, I'm gonna sit in front of the screen and I'm gonna test certain things and I'm gonna bash my keyboard. And then after repeating the test five million times, I'm gonna be done with testing. So that has kind of been a shift of late. Um, and we, we kind of sketched the new career of being a developer, but still being a tester at the same time. Um, another thing that is quite interesting is we use um, work with a business analysis to understand what our requirements are, and, and this kind of where you might need um, the heuristics I explained a bit previously. Um, there's some other analysis tools and analysis techniques that you can do uh, if you guys are interested about like probably you can Google static analysis, whatever the case might be. Um, I kind of mentioned um, the kind of the, the test framework development that we do. We have a performance testing standard. So performance testing is a quite, a, it's quite to me the most interesting bit of testing um, where you actually get to play around and throw stress a system in various ways that make sense for whatever you want to prove. Um, you get to break systems, you get to see them explode or whatever the case might be. So you get a little bit of that. Um, and obviously, um, our whole idea is, and that's where the reporting bit comes in, is that we have clients. So obviously, when you look at testing, so <coughs> we don't actually do any coding, we don't break systems, they're actually all broken when they're given to us, and we just merely pointing it out to them. So um, <laughs> people thinking that software testing is breaking software, well, sorry, we're just actually reporting on something. So yeah, we, we are a bunch of really demanding set of people who makes the system do all sorts of things that uh, might somehow not be envisaged about the developer um, before they actually code it. And um, I think the two arrows on the side kind of is like a kind of a tug of war going on. So deciding, okay, so, which approach should I take versus which kind of expectation do I have? So it might be nice to say, well, okay, I'm gonna use the latest and greatest, um, or I'm gonna use, um, um, whatever the case would be, I can't even think about it, some tool, and I'm gonna spend one month, and let's see how I can automate some payment system, and obviously, that might not be the expectation of people saying, well, okay, we're not gonna give you five million pounds to go and spend on licenses, and, um, and come up and, and automate five tests so that you can say, okay, this is a really cool tool, I think I should use it again. That's not always the case. And, and obviously understanding um, who our clients are. So typically our clients would be our dev teams. We work very closely with our dev teams. We work with our business analysis. Um, we have what we call the business. So our business is kind of our operations team, um, depending on where you are in the hierarchy. It might be a front office kind of system where it's kind of a UI or you might be back office where it's more like STP straight through processing that you need to have a look at. Obviously, as you are kind of testing those systems, you kind of have a different approach that you follow. So uh, quite a few business areas that we do cover, um, quite a few clients that we need to kind of give confidence in what we do and making sure that um, when things go into production uh, and people actually use it, that it doesn't fall over or at least not explode and somebody actually lose money or somebody could be involved in some court case, whatever the case might be. So yeah. Okay. Okay, well that's kind of a short thing. Any other questions that I can answer for somebody? What kind of testing do you do the most like a performance testing or do you do all of those types of testing or do you have any specialization? So there's always a yes and no to every answer that I'll give. <laughs> so basically, it really depends um, on, on, on what is required. So obviously, um, as you get to, to work with new products, obviously you need to, 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 before you can go and put a new system into production, you need to have some capacity test that you need to do. So yeah, you could do a lot of performance tests. In a project that I'm working with, for example, we need to process uh, 18 million transactions an hour. Um, so obviously you need to do some performance tests to make sure the system works. We have a performance test team, which is a bunch of 
professional performance testers. All they do the whole day is do performance testing, and uh, yeah, they're based in Glasgow. Yep, and they had use all the latest and greatest things, and and don't do anything else except performance testing. Should the tester be told how to test by the steps or should the tester be only told what it is about and then come up with the testing themselves? Alright, so just going back to what I said before. So first of all, you need to understand what you need to test. You need to understand what you want to get out of it, what is good behavior, what is bad behavior. Um, and things like that. So typically, um, I would say no, um, but a lot of the time it's important that you understand the scope, and obviously people need to tell you what the scope is. So yeah, so you need to understand what the scope is so that you can um, kind of know what you need to test. So I think the greatest kind of challenge in that specific area would be that people think, oh, it's so easy to test, and people always have their own understanding or own opinion of how you need to test something, which actually might or might not be the right answer and um, it takes quite a bit of reporting or kind of explanation on, on why you think something the way that you do um, and um, how you decided to come to that approach. Any questions on the from the back? When is uh, the best time for staff to do this thing, some uh, software in development? Alright, so that's an interesting one. So the answer would be start as soon as you can. So um, the greatest testing I have done was go going over to a developer's desk. Um, I just kind of heard about something happening and uh, I was just asking him, okay, so how does the system work? And by just asking them questions about how it works and then kind of flipping this, the conversation around and say, well, okay, what will happen if it doesn't work like that? And typically they would come up with, oh, I forgot to include that component, or oh, I forgot to, to think about that. Um, and um, they might just go running back to the, the kind of drawing board. And if you would kind of did that right at the end, just before everything is working and, and nobody would have thought about those Kind of problems, then obviously that would be like a, quite a bit more expensive. Same with um, the classic example is so you have business analysis and they go here and they write all these wonderful specifications or they choose to not write wonderful specifications and they throw it over the fence and then they run away and say, Oh, we're busy, we can't speak to you anymore. Um, and you look at these documents and um, you think by yourself, So, what does it mean? And, and, and that is part of testing, that is static analysis. It's not, testing is the, the, the performance of, okay, I'm gonna run some applications, I'm gonna check the test work as they should. That is a very small percentage. And if you're ever forced into doing a lot of testing only at the end, then well, then there's something really wrong with your project. Um, so yeah, so testing is, 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 is a kind of a, the, the earlier that you can do, you can, you can get involved, the better. So obviously, you can't like sit next to a business analyst or whoever that's or sit, sit next to a user and tell them ask them, so how do you want the system to work when nobody even has a look at how the architecture might look or, or what kind of functional requirements that might come up with the case of the Well how did you get to the testing? Or did you choose yourself like when you were in school, like I want to be a tester, I want to test the software or was it like I, I think that uh, that you said that you switched the whole part list, uh, or I heard it wrong, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, so let, you get, let me give you the more detailed answer. So, the answer to it, I kind of fell into testing. <laughs> nobody, it's like nobody really kind of has, oh, I want to become a software tester, right? I've, I've never actually met someone <coughs> who, who came out of university, oh, I want to become a software tester. People are like, whoa, what the heck? Basically, I was a software developer. Um, I was a Java developer a few years ago longer than I came to tell you guys. Um, and um, yeah, I decided that, oh, I had enough of South Africa and I went to England and um, for some reason I became a software tester. And um, I kind of been doing it for 15 years and um, yeah, I've moved on now to being a business analyst. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Why are two questions? 
first, how do you measure the success rate of your work? Or uh, I mean, um, how do you measure it in the marketplace? And second one is how many errors you obtain after you know after you make the, the application public? If you have any any errors there, or how many of them that you didn't find? All right. So the correct answer to that one would be well, it depends on what you see and and agree with your product stakeholders as a success. So um, it's easy to, to have this metric to say, well, okay, when I go into production, I'm not allowed to have less more than one defect, whatever the case might be, for so long a time. I think um, in, in a lot of instances, we, we're working against time to market, and uh, so sometimes you might kind of offset defects to getting stuff quicker to, to the market. And, but flip side to that is if, if you, um, you need to kind of have timelines are not that critical, I think it becomes more and more kind of un, uh, critical in a project that people understand where the success areas are because it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a one solution fits all because it's, you've got so many industries. I mean, an airline, if you work in software test in the airline industry, I mean, can you imagine, it doesn't matter what defect is, it's unacceptable because a plane will crash and people will die. Whereas if you have a trading system, well, okay, so if you can put zeros in the systems and the only is supposed to be used once, then obviously that's not maybe as critical as you might think it is. So it really depends. Um, um, at the end well, of the I mean, the Berkeley is your bank, right? Well, yeah, but it, it really, it really, there's no, there's no official. So we have, we have a very, very loose criteria, um, which is that um, we're not allowed to have. Uh, we're not allowed to have any severity one defect, which basically means that somebody is unable to do their work uh, because of a software defect. So that can come in various ways and forms. So that's kind of the metric that we work against, and that's how we kind of can decide. Okay, these are, are, are we basically need to to say uh, or rather present our test results, our test approach, and saying well. Based on these risk criteria that you've identified, we've done these tests, and basically, based on the results of these tests, we can say that you will not have your severity one defects in production when it actually goes into production. So, yeah. Any other questions? Um, how difficult you think would it be to learn stuff like this? I don't know at home or from books or something like that. Interesting question. So in a smaller uh, scale, like um, really tiny projects compared to those you you talked about. Um, it does to me. The size of the project has got no bearing in in that. Um, we had, I would say, um, there's like you can basically like. They've got these really bad certifications that they do present in the market where you basically can be a certified tester in a week, <laughs> which doesn't really mean anything. Um, but there's some other courses available um, that you can skill yourself up. I mean, I've had people um, picking up being really excellent testers in, in, in months, all right, but obviously it's, it's kind of context specific. So obviously you need to kind of hook tool sets to it. Um, I think. The, the really important bit of testing is that all these things don't actually come, it's not something you can learn, it's something that you need to practice. Because even up to this day, if I'm lazy and I don't ask the questions when I should ask them, it comes back to bite me. And it was like, okay, I should have practiced this more and disciplined myself more to be able to give the answers that I was supposed to give. So it's, a, it's kind of an ongoing thing. Um, I, I, I'm not gonna say there's a different timeline that you need to do. So in the industry, um, I think there's two kind of school of thought. The one being let's use I, I triple E A two nine whatever the case may be, and let's standardize testing, and that really doesn't tell you much. And then you've got another one which I subscribe to, which is called the context driven testing um, school, which basically tells us, okay, we need to test something. We need to make sure we understand how the context relates to what we're doing and what we want to achieve at the end of the day, instead of having a fit fit one fit size or one size fits all approach and one approach fits all kind of things that we need to do. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? Well, I'm not sure, but you know, I'm not even sure there is like an answer to it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's it's uh, it's very difficult to learn it from 
um, just trying it on your own projects in your own company or stuff like that, isn't it? Well, when you say your own project, what do you mean by that? Uh, well, I work for a guy and uh, well, there's more of us and we do some, um, some applications, for example, uh, small ones, uh, but still they, um, well, the testing is like the most important part of it. And um, yeah, there are many complications with it, so I really would like to learn it, but I don't know how to start or where to start. Well, the most simple thing to do is, okay, is let's see what you've done wrong, and, and if you've done something wrong, all right, so the assumption would be that I've done something, let's look at the errors that I missed, and, and do some analysis on them, saying why did I miss this, why why did I not pick this up when, was, when I was supposed to have checked it out? Because that's probably when you learn the most about it. And looking at your errors um, and, and, and say, well, okay, I might make errors, but there's some things I can do to kind of prevent this from happening again. I mean, I might write some initial automated tests. I might tell my, my client, say, well, okay, you didn't give me enough information on this specific module. Can you please give me a bit more information to understand exactly what this is supposed to be doing? So, yeah. It, it, it kind of it, it comes. It's a kind of a social kind of thing, uh, interaction with with your stakeholders, and it's really important to understand what they want because that is the only way how you can truly test something that you want to do um, do well. So there's you can't just expect somebody to throw something in your lap, and you you might try to do the best, but at the end of the day, you might miss so many things just because you didn't know what they actually want to achieve with giving them to you. So yeah, it's not it's not oh I'm the test I can do anything kind of thing. It's actually, I'm a tester, and because I'm a tester, I need to be very wary of what things might go wrong, and I need to understand what would happen if something goes wrong. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, I guess that's a wrap. <laughs> cool, thank you.